Um, i tell you something. I, I really like the second book of the Maccabees much better than the first, even though it's not as good a historical work. The spirit to me is more pure. Uh, it's more, you know, I mean, the first one's okay, but you, you, you get the feeling in that presentation of Simon how, oh, the people would have been angry if he hadn't done as much as he could to save his brother's uh, his wife, if he hadn't given his brother's children into the murderers. You, you get a lot of um, odd um, vibes, if you like, from that. And uh, it, 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 it seems, I don't say corrupt, but it um, obviously it's uh, written from the point of view of Simon's uh, rise to power. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean, like you guys were asking me before, whether um, it's a good picture of, uh, of Judas. I think it's a fair, it's a, it's a fair picture of uh, Judas. Probably more fair than Maccabees too, in the sense it doesn't over-idealize him, and it gives his achievements, and it tells about his death, and I think the, the, when it says he was, uh, looks like he was pretty popular, I think that's probably true. I don't think there's any indication, as I said, that he usurped anything. And certainly now these people are not usurping anything, the brothers, because they're getting official appointments. So they're not usurping anything as far as the official record would would go. And why am I worried about that? Because Cross says in his book that the Maccabeans usurped the high priesthood. He does that in, in uh, uh, like most people in Dead Sea School Studies, and he's at Harvard, and he's really the doyen in America, Frank Moore Cross, uh, most of his students have gone on, and I hope they never see this tape, uh, but um, <laughs> most of his students have gone on into positions of uh, prominence in the universities because Harvard is able to wield that kind of influence, unfortunately. That's the way it works. Uh, names um, say a lot in, um, in uh, society, whatever the society. So um, that doesn't mean that, uh, as I said, that their uh, approach is necessarily to be recommended. So um, this usurping comes from people like him, and it's become a widespread idea. And most scholars are people who like to be in herds. I don't want to say herds men, herds people, flock people. They, uh, they really like to stand out. I mean, I don't understand why, because it's exciting to uh, be in the uh, situation of uh, representing something and confronting other people, etc. That, that, that should be, it seems to me, what uh, most scholars should and like to do. But most are, are, are quite timid and uh, they don't like to uh, get in a situation of that kind if they can help it. And so they uh, quickly adopt the reigning view, which is usually from the best university, or what's considered to be the most prestigious university. So when someone says at Harvard that uh, Judas Maccabee and the Maccabeans usurped the high priesthood, that becomes almost gospel for several generations. And that's uh, what I'm trying to combat. There's no indication that that's the case. And in fact, the opposite looks like the case. So uh, he's a popular high priest, and uh, he certainly is functioning as a high priest. And in fact, Josephus will tell us Judas was elected to the high priesthood twice. That's in the antiquities, and uh, by the people. And now I, I, I think that's accurate. It's not in either of the Maccabee books as such, but that's the impression that you get. Okay, so now we have a uh, second book, uh, chapter two. We find in the archives of the prophet uh, Jeremiah about the Ark of the Covenant, the good stuff for Steven Spielberg about how there's a book called The Memoirs of the Dove Nehemiah, chapter uh, line 13, and how Judas collected the copies of the Bible as we now have it, which they're willing to send. This is the story of Judas Maccabee, line 19, and his brothers, chapter 2. The dedication of the altar, and this is why this book is looked down upon a bit, because of the manifestations from heaven, heavenly beings, heavenly horsemen, heavenly intervention in human affairs. And so it's not, strictly speaking, a straight history. And of course, um, 
those people brought up on the New Testament don't mind manifestations from heaven. They think that's fairly normal, I think, in, in the course of uh, human events and the presentation of, of uh, human events. So they, uh, people from that um, background wouldn't consider this a defect. But scholars and universities, I think, probably do consider it in academ ac academic circles a defect. And therefore, Maccabees II is little regarded. But I think Maccabees II has a, 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 regardless of its, you know, heavenly manifestations type of material in it, it, it is, uh, it has a pure spirit. And uh, it's only interest in uh, Judas, and it's honest about things. Like in line 23, it says that it took its material from the five books of Jason of Cyrene and uh, digested it. Well, that's, that's honest. So it gives you its source. So uh, it may be uh, uh, over-enthusiastic, but it's also somewhat, uh, its spirit is uh, honest if its history is a little bit uh, maybe over-enthusiastic. So first, chapter 3, we get Onias the high priest that we talked about earlier. And uh, this is before all the trouble began. And the laws were observed as perfectly as could be on 3.1 under Onias, and the, the, he was very pious, so we have the piety idea there. And now before the others, we have problems here of a certain Simon uh, of uh, the priestly course of Bilga, one of the other priestly courses, or lesser priestly course. And he wanted to take over the high priesthood and so on and so forth. So we get a lot of infighting here, a lot of trouble, and then uh, we get some Seleucid intervention. This is before Antiochus and before. And then this uh, representative of the king, someone line 13 called Heliodorus comes, and uh, he wants to raid the temple treasury, and everyone is horrified by this. 24, he gets to the treasury here, and then in the middle of all this, a heavenly horseman appears. So this is not straight history, probably. Uh, rearing violently, it struck Heliodorus with its four feet on chapter 25, I mean line 25. The rider was accoutred entirely in gold, and two other young men of beautiful strength and beauty magnificently apparelled, took him and flogged him unremittingly. Well, you see, we've gotten enthusiastic here. <laughs> this is Sir Galahad. Uh, Galahad has appeared on the scene. Sir Lancelot and uh, King Arthur and the whole bunch. But these are, this is clearly angelic figures. But not our idea of angels with uh, wings and uh, you know, halos and stuff. These are Guys have armor. These angels have armor. <laughs> and so, this is a divine visitation, 29. And they say, ask Onias, line 31, to, to, to forgive you and uh, uh, give you life. So it's a kind of resurrection a la Jesus Christ later on here. And so he's doesn't die or he's resurrected one of the two. And be grateful to Onias the high priest, 33, since it's for his sake the Lord has granted you your life. So this is a kind of Onias the righteous, if you want to call him that. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the end of that episode. So Onias is a pretty good chap. The heavenly people like him. And so you see, he plays the role of who in Maccabees 1? Mattathai. Now this is the previous priesthood here. The previous priesthood up till the time of all this problem. The same Simon though is uh, making trouble in chapter 4. And he slandered Onias further. And he had the effrontery to name this benefactor of the city. This protector of his fellow countrymen. This zealot for the law. So he's a, Onias is a zealot. He's a proper zealot I presume. Now here is usurpation. His brother, Jason, seven, usurps the high priesthood from him. Like 
Alchemus in the other book, he is line 13, a godless wretch. Because he was not righteous and pious, he's no true high priest, but there were no bounds to his impiety. So he's not a good guy. And another guy, after three years, the brother of Simon comes called Menelaus. They all have these Greek names. He has backing from the Seleucids too. Everyone seems to get backing from these Seleucids. And he gets a hold of the high priest, and Onias finally is taken captive to Antioch and murdered by 33. So he's martyred. So this all happens before the Judas Maccabee stuff. Then we have infighting between these other priests, Menelaus, Jacob, and then Antiochus Epiphanes finally appears in line 11 of chapter 5. And uh, Menelaus is the uh, priest that's cooperating with him. This traitor to the law, 15, acted as his guide. So he was in cahoots with Antiochus. He's the ones who the Maccabee books are condemning at the beginning, remember? These backsliders and renegades who uh, cooperate with foreign power and so on. But what do these people seem to be mostly after when they come to Jerusalem? The plunder the temple of the tre temple treasure. And now, as we saw last time or previously, Judas Maccabee is introduced in 527. Then Judas called Maccabeus with nine others withdrew into the wilderness and lived like wild animals in the hills with his companions eating nothing but wild plants to avoid contracting the fire. Does anyone have a different translation that significantly different and means uh, that it's not uh, similar? So he's a vegetarian, clearly, but not just a vegetarian. He, he grows things that, he only eats things which grow of themselves. He doesn't even raise things. Wild plants, untucked by people. Um, and he's a John the Baptist type. Uh, that's uh, very important. And interestingly enough, look, there are nine others. Uh, is there say about nine others? Yeah. So in any case, they're all together they make about ten. And uh, that could be the idea of the ten just men. You know, when uh, in Genesis, the first uh, introduction of righteous men, when Abraham uh, bargains with the angel, or who turned out to be God, for uh, the saving of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, it gets down to how many men will he save a city for? For the sake of ten just men, he would withhold destruction from the city. I think that's why this is said, the ten just men. And you know, in Judaism, even today, uh, the number for a prayer is ten. That for the sake of ten just men, God would withhold destruction from the world. Let's hope there are ten just men in Long Beach. So our port is not nuked by the people uh, Cheney was talking about last night who are going to smuggle nuclear weapons into our cities and kill us all. Let's hope that uh, we have 10 just men and women here that will uh, not allow this to happen. Okay. So we have the Olympian Zeus, chapter 6. We did all this. Now, the thing you were interested in, the, the martyrdom episodes. It starts in line 18. First, you get the people who won't defend themselves on the Sabbath. That's around line 11. And then line 18, Eliezer. The reason I like my Bible, you say, how do you, are you able to do this, Professor Washington? Because my Bible, that's why it uses this Bible still, is so well laid out that it has all the headings, exactly what's going on in each section, it's not divided down the middle like that Bible where you can't find anything in unless you hunt like a you know maniac or you know. And it's this Bible is prior to that one. This one is the previous one, and they re re-edit it like that. And this is better because it goes all the way across the page. I mean, look at the mess I've made of it. I'm sorry about that, but you know. And you know, it, I've got the headings. That's why I religiously, even though there's some translations I don't like in this, but. I fell out of this Bible because it's so well organized and so easy to follow. And uh, I've never found any Bibles that are, are, are 
done as well as that for teaching and study purposes. Put that way. I don't mean for inspirational, any Bible reading, right? But you, you say, how does he find these things? <laughs> because it's all I laid out for me. Um, anyway, I, and I've got I've gone to used bookstores, and these, these Bibles are, are are there. And those used bookstores, and when they have those religious sections, if you've been to those kind of bookstores, they have all these old religious books, like they have uh, concordances and all kinds of stuff there. And they always have one or two of these old Jerusalem Bibles there. And uh, boy, if you see one, that's a new one. See, and they're not as good. If, if, you, if you see one, boy, and uh, you can grab it because they're really, uh, they're, they're really uh, worth it. They're really worth it. Who's got one of these ones? You have one. That's, no, you have two, two columns. No. Anyone have this one here? No. Well, I recommend it highly. That's all I can tell you. Because you just can find your way through so easy. Okay. So um, someone really did the good work here. Eliezer, one of the foremost teachers of the law, line 18, very old, noble appearance. They tried to make him eat pig flesh. You see, now this isn't uh, in the Colosseum and being burned at the stake and all this sort of stuff in early Christianity. What's the issue here? The law of Moses. Dietary regulations. And just as uh, the Christian martyrs later are presented as willing to die for their faith and so on. Here, it's already preceded by these martyrs here. And uh, the issue here is not being willing to eat forbidden food. And so, this is what the Nazis would have done too, I'm sure, just more recently. They would have taken people like this and tried to make fun of them, stick you know, pork in their mouth or do stuff like that, you know, just humiliate them. I don't know why people behave like this, but anymore. Apparently our troops do too, because the reports out of Iraq are that uh, some people of our uh, kind of uh, army uh, also uh, misbehaves to some extent with prisoners. I guess it's uh, part of the brutalization of human nature and uh, what calls it that. Anyway, he resolved to die with honor. This book is encouraging what? Even more than Maccabees 1, martyrdom. This book wants you to choose death rather than be corrupted, polluted, uh, wanting to cooperate with foreign people who are unjust and uh, impure. Uh, so this is quite an episode here, and this will be followed by the seven brothers that I think is parodied in the Gospels and when, in the uh, episode of, when Jesus is asked by the Sadducees and the Pharisees again. It's about resurrection of the dead when uh, Jesus is asked, uh, if uh, one brother uh, dies and the next brother gets his wife and the next brother dies, and next, I mean, that's a totally uh, crude parable, if you like. parodying this episode here about the resurrection of the dead and the seven brothers. And they're laughing at Jewish marital laws that the brothers can marry their brothers' wives if they haven't had children or something. It's a very nasty little uh, parable, unless you're just not aware of what it's trying to do. You just take the superficial meaning. The people who wrote it knew that they were being nasty. Jesus never said that, I can assure you. Insofar as he would we can say anything about it. I assure you, we never said that. Now, that's an attack on Jewish law, Jewish um, customs, and particularly this seven brothers. Thing. It's making nonsense of the seven brothers. Whose wife will she have in the resurrection? Who, who, which of the brothers will be uh, she be married to in the resurrection? I, it's just preposterous. And it's an attack on the, uh, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees arguing about resurrection of the dead. I don't remember. Hold up, so but some of you may know that particular parable. But it goes back to this here. Um, anyway, this book wants resurrection. Um, and he, even though he's of great age and gray hairs, uh, he will not 
go against the holy legislation established by God. He was 90, and, but he would not conform to the foreigner's way of life, line 25. He would not be led astray. Therefore, if I am a man, line 27, to, if I am man enough to quit this life here and now, I shall prove myself worthy of my old age. I shall have left the young a noble example of how to make a good death there eagerly and generously for the venerable and holy laws. That is the ethos of this book. That is the ethos of the Maccabean movement at this point, and that is the ethos of this period, and that is the thing that Paul is going <coughs> against when he's trying to attack this ethos. So this is like, you couldn't be more anti-Paul than this book. And these, So you have to understand, when you say, why don't the Jews or someone, why don't they follow Paul? Well, I mean, I'm not saying this is anything beautiful we have before us, but they're brought up on this. They're not going to uh, go back on this. Uh, that would be to uh, disavow everything that they stood for. They would never, never, wouldn't be, uh, just not even in the realm of possible. People just don't appreciate that. They say, oh, they're just being stiff necked just being stubborn, you know, what's wrong with them? Why don't they just sit down with everyone else and, you know, eat the same food as everyone else and stop making trouble? Yeah, that's, that's a noble thought, but this is their culture, this is their heritage. They would be, they would be betraying their uh, forefathers. No one likes to betray their forefathers. I told you this, Uncle Warren. Here's a good example. I don't have to go any more on that one. Make a good death. That's the point of Eliezer. Then chapter 7, the seven brothers. Again, the whole thing. Uh, do I believe this episode? Not particularly. It's a literary episode. Maybe something similar happened. Anyway, it's a writer trying to encourage people to stand firm and not give in. So again, they're seven brothers and they want to make them eat pig flesh. We are prepared to die rather than break the laws of our forefathers, lines three and four. The king, whoever he is, is really furious at Dr. Epiphanes, I guess. And he gets a big fire going. And he's going to burn them alive in a pan. You think this is crazy, but in Sudan today, this is what they do. They raid these villages and they get a big fire going. They throw the little children alive into the fire. And nobody in the world does anything about it. Just sit here like a bunch of dumbos and let these fanatic, uh, you know, and nobody intervenes. And we have the force to intervene because we're afraid of Saudi oil. Money. It's always the same corrupt stuff. Really so sad. So, I mean, I, 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 I heard the description from some of these women, what they described. I mean, it's like you just got, oh, you just cannot, you just cannot imagine what these people do and what they go through. And we think it's now, but they're, they're, this is what they do. They, they build a bonfire and they throw the kids in in front of their mothers. Okay, and it's actually happening. Um, and the UN sits and debates these things and gives some ultimatum about uh, sanctions or some such rubbish. So, the fire is burning and as soon as they're red hot, they going to cut his tongue out, his head scalp, his extremities cut off while his brothers looked on and he was rendered helpless and the smoke of the pan drifted to the mother. But she encouraged each one after the other. See, this is a, the, even the mother. Now, I know a lot of Jewish people today, and if uh, this happened today, the mother would say, no, no, save yourself, son. They wouldn't say, die nobly for the loss of your ancestors. It's a different age, different time, different place, unfortunately. But anyway, I don't expect people to say this anyway, but the point is, the writer wants you to be encouraged to resist. And so he says, the mom says to him, Die no, the Lord God is watching, and he will pity us, as in the song that Moses bore witness against the people to their face, proclaiming he would, God would pity his servants. So the first left the world, then they took the second, stripped the skin from his head and hair. Will you eat? before your body is tortured limb by limb? And he retorted in the tongue of his forefathers, never. And he too was tortured. And in his last breath he said, inhuman fiend, you may discharge us from the present life, but the king of the world will raise us up 
since it is for his laws that we lie, that we die to live again forever. There you have it. Combine this with Daniel and you've got the whole martyrdom, resurrection ethic. That's what you were trying to point Yeah. That's what, there, there it is. Die for the law, you will be read for a resurrection. And, uh, so, he's killed. The third is brought. And he says, It's heaven that gave me these limbs, and for the sake of his law I disdain them, but I hope to receive them back again. And he does. And then the fourth, ours is the better choice to meet death at men's hands. Yet relying on God's promise, we shall be raised up by him. Whereas for you, there will be no resurrection, no new life. Now you see how Maccabees are two differs from Daniel. Daniel pictures a resurrection of kind of like a heaven and hell. But Maccabees too, only the righteous are resurrected. <coughs> particularly the martyr right, the martyred righteous. The rest just stay dead. And that goes into the Christian uh, you want to call it Christian, I'm not sure it is yet. Idea of uh, who goes into the kingdom. The righteous living and the righteous dead, because the righteous living are going to go into the kingdom. That's what all these rapture people are involved in today. They're rapturing themselves into the kingdom. Because they're not going to die. You don't have to die to get into the kingdom, I hope. The only thing there, the only people who have to die to get to the kingdom are the people who already are dead. They, they, we just want to get them in too, so we've got to resurrect them. So this concept is that uh, you know you, you you are going to enjoy this kingdom and live forever if you're righteous. I don't know where they got this idea, but it's coming in at this point. Coming in. So again, now the fourth, ours is the better choice to meet death at men's hands, and you will have no resurrection, no new life. That's a really important point, and uh, you see it's uh, different this book than the others. Now. So then the fifth, and then the sixth, you're making war on God. But the mother in the seventh is now, you know, it's like Mary, mother of Jesus. She's especially worthy, the mother of these seven brothers. That's why I think the parody of the seven brothers in the Gospels is really pretty, uh, pretty, um, not very high money. I'll be putting it as gently as I can. To make fun of this thing, even though it's not a great piece of literature, these are noble uh, sentiments. And to laugh about it in a way. And say, well, how do you know they're laughing? Because it's clear that they're talk talking about the seven brothers and who are they going to enjoy after the resurrection? Who's going to get the wife? And laughing at the Jewish custom of uh, you know, raising up seed for your, for your brother, marrying your brother's wife. Someone in Rome or Alexandria or someplace was having a good joke at the dinner party when they uh, figured out that one. Uh, let's have a good laugh at them and make fun of them. And, and it's not, it's not, it isn't noble because this is, a, whether it's a very eloquent or not, it's still a very noble passage to, uh, very admirable in terms of the portrait of these people. I don't know how you appeared in my womb. I did not give you breath and life. I had not the shaping of every part of you. It's the creator of the world that ordained the process of man's birth and presided over the origin of all things, who in his mercy, line 23, will most surely give you back your breath and life, seeing that you now despise your own existence for the sake of his law. So you're going to get, because of the law, if you die for the law, you will, you will be resurrected. So th this is, uh, Antiochus is laughing at this. My son, pity me. Don't pity me because you're dying. Pity me and, and, and die nobly. The, the Jews are certainly a different people back then, let me tell you. And um, I think they're changing again. I think the, the Israel uh, period, uh, situation has put them into the, uh, if you want, um, the furnace of affliction. And uh, new people is being uh, born out of that one too. Whether it's um, what will be the final fate, I can't say. but. Uh, I think uh, it's amazing to watch the transformation. Uh, I think the spirit is, is coming alive there to some extent. I may be uh, over optimistic. I carried you nine months in my womb. I suckled you three years. Hey, they suckled children three years. 
didn't have bottles and uh, you know uh, formula stuff like that. Three years. That's a pretty hard work. Three years, huh? Uh, reared you to the age you are now, I implore you, child, observe heaven and earth, consider all that is in them, and God, acknowledge God made them out of, look at this, out of what did not exist. So we even have a, a, an advanced philosophical concept here. If you know in philosophy, many of you take creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. It's a, a philosophical concept that uh, uh, was known in the late Middle Ages, and it's already known here. God created them out of what did not exist. Creation out of nothing. That's a, we think of it as a really more recent idea. It's already back in this second century BC period. And mankind the same way. Do not fear the execution. Prove yourself worthy of your brothers. Make death well. Why am I reading all this? Uh, because you can't get it if you don't read it. I mean, I can tell you it's here, but you have to read that loud to, to get the sense of it. So on the day of mercy, the day of the resurrection, I may receive you back again in your brother's company. Now, that also, to my mind, if you read this carefully, explains the Masada suicide. The reason they chose suicide is that on the day of mercy, they would receive him back uh, uh, in your brother's company. That uh, that was better than surrendering and being corrupted, taken to Rome, being used as a, a prostitute or a uh, you know sex slave or, or or some other such thing. And uh, that's why they all chose to die so that they could enjoy the resurrection and how do I know this because in this Masada place where this mass suicide occurred in the Roman war something Mel Gibson wouldn't know anything about uh, where a mass suicide occurred in the Roman war the bones passage from Ezekiel is buried under the uh, synagogue floor there so that showed they believed in the resurrection of the dead by the bones of Ezekiel and uh, I believe that they did and I believe that's why they committed suicide and the reason is right here in this book. So that on the day of resurrection of mercy, I will receive you back again. Otherwise, you see, they won't be resurrected. They won't, they won't be in each other's company. It's a lovely thought. It really is. I wish I could believe in these things. Okay. Now, the boy says, 37, I too, like my brother, surrender my body and life for the laws of my ancestors, calling on God to show kindness to our nation and by trials and afflictions to bring you to confess that he alone is God, so that with my brothers and myself there may be an end to the wrath, the wrath of Daniel, of the Almighty, that has been let least on our nation. And the king was fell into rage, and the last brother met his end, undefiled, uncorrupted, unpolluted. Unpolluted. Um, and in the New Testament, we have Jesus talking about what goes into the mouth cannot pollute the man, only what goes out of the mouth. What goes into the mouth goes down the, the throat, into the belly, and out the toilet drain. He said this, declaring all foods clean, says the Gospel of Mark. So, you have to range this against this. Who's writing the Gospel of Mark? Who's saying those things? Who's, who is it, Jesus? Or someone putting words into Jesus' mouth? Is that going to fly in Palestine against this in this atmosphere of two centuries? Of course not. It can only fly in Rome. It can only fly in Greece or Asia Minor or Alexandria. Someone in those cities is writing it. It's not the Messiah in Palestine. But they're saying this is the Messiah in Palestine. No, no. Messiah in Palestine, to be a popular Messiah, has got to represent these ideas. Oh, no, they said that's what's so unique about him. He didn't. Oh, people are not going to change. It's impossible. Anyway, I'm going to keep on uh, being a dead horse, but that, that's so important here. This undefined. He said this declaring all foods clean. And uh, he then said, you don't need to wash your hands before you eat. The person who wrote that material was going way overboard with his antagonism towards Jewish uh, traditional customs. To the point that he uh, made a fool of himself. Because today we know that if you don't wash your hands before eating, you might catch germs. So yeah, nobody would say you shouldn't wash your hands before eating. But the person who wrote that, and I don't blame Jesus for this at all, I'm sure Jesus never said any of those things, um, was someone from Alexandria or Rome. How do you know, Professor Ivan? Because I know that was what they were thinking. That's their, they were really 
angry at the Jews who were behaving like this. Really angry. Anyway, so they took their most precious concepts and put a Hellenized uh, uh, approach into that concept. I don't have to keep on on that score. Skip it. Judas the Maccabeus, then chapter 8, went around the country secretly. He had about 6,000 followers. And uh, he called upon the Lord to help him, take pity on the temple, polluted. So he's against the pollution of the temple by godless people in ruin, and so on. 21, having roused the cur their courage with the words, they were ready to die. He had all these four brothers. We didn't hear about them in the other book. only heard about three. Simon, Joseph, Jonathan, and Esdrius, or Esdras. Uh, so, um, that's another brother there. Here's the Nicanor person, Antiochus Epiphanes, chapter 9 dies. Don't have time to read all this. Chapter 10, Judas purifies the temple. Uh, they offered the first sacrifice in two years, line 10, 3. This is the day of the purification of the temple, profaned by foreigners. Again, it's the anti foreign you see. 25th day of Kislev. They shall keep eight days rejoicing of the Feast of Tabernacles. Not long be uh, that before the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, they have been living in mountains and caverns like wild beasts. You see, this is to commemorate the wilderness experience. Now, I, that's even further. Hanukkah, what most Jews have no idea, is to commemorate the wilderness experience of Judas Maccabee. But not the miracle of lights. It's the wilderness experience of living in mountains and caves like John the Baptist. And they celebrated it and ratified it by vote, line 8. So this is a holiday ratified by vote by the people. Uh, do I believe that happened? Yeah, we actually have the institution of a holiday and we have the record of it being ratified by the vote of the people. I believe that's an actually accurate uh, you know, description of uh, how it came to be. It was a vote. It was approved by the people. All right, I have to hurry up here. Chapter 10, more battles here. Uh, more, more heavenly horsemen look appeared 29 when the battle was at its height. Five magnificent horsemen appeared from heaven on gold horses with golden bridles, put themselves at the head of the Jews. Uh, this guy is getting carried away again. So this is not a real history. It's more enthusiasm, but noble, noble enthusiasm. Here's another one, chapter 11. They were still standing near Jerusalem when a rider attired in white Again, Sir Galahad appeared at the head, brandishing gold accoutrements. And they blessed God. They advanced in the battle order with the aid of the celestial ally. Is that what you have, 10 and 11 of chapter 11, celestial ally? Who has a better translation than that? They advanced in the battle with the aid of what? Heavenly ally. Okay. But that's going to be the Dead Sea Scroll. The War Scroll believes that the heavenly host is going to intervene on their behalf and that the heavenly angels are going to be in their camps. We're going to hear that time and time again in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And here is the uh, prelude to it right here. That they believed that they were totally pure and totally, uh, you know, uh, without uh, blemish or whatever, that the angels would come down and fight on their side and they could defeat the Roman Empire. Very sad, actually, to... Uh, that's a problem here in uh, chapter... Uh, well, some idols, a little bit, there's a similar episode in Acts when they discover some idols under some of the followers or some money that was stolen or whatever. In any case, um, Judas, as a result of all these things, urged the people in 42 to keep themselves free of sin, seeing the effect of this on these sinful people who had you know, lapsed into idolatry. And he took a collection from the army. And he collected 2,000 drachmas, and sent it to Jerusalem to have a sacrifice for sin offered, an altogether fine and noble action in which he took full account of the resurrection. For if he had not expected the fallen to rise again, it would have been superfluous, superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. Whereas if he had in view the splendid recompense reserved for those who make a pious end. There's the Hasidian movement. Make a pious end. 
The thought was holy and devout Kiddushim. That was why this atonement sacrifice offered for the dead, so they might be released from their sins. So, again, Eliezer, seven brothers, and this. Make a pious end. Explain, I think, the Okay, we have one more martyrdom episode here. That's my chapter 13, we're dealing with this Menelaus character. Uh, leaving his men in line 15 with the watchword victory from God. I love that one. He made a night attack on the king's uh, camp. Destroyed 2,000. Dawn was just broken, bro breaking as they brought to an end through the protection of the Lord watching over Judas. That sounds like an authentic episode. You even have the password, victory from God. <laughs> Dead Sea Scrolls have those kind of scrolls. Yeah, yeah right. Right. Chapter 14. Here's where Alchemus, or Alcimus, who had occurred to Philemon at the time of the insurrection, I don't know which insurrection he means, goes and tries to get the high priesthood from Demetrius, and here where he calls the Jews called Hasidans, who stopped the kingdom from, from settling down. So they are the followers of, uh, of Judas of Maccabee par excellence. And Nicanor then, uh, at the end of that, uh, Simon engages him, but then he takes up residence in Jerusalem. Oh, here's where Judas married and settled down. I thought it was in Maccabees 1, it's in Maccabees 2, line 25. Uh, so uh, it's in this period. So we get these machinations of, I don't can't follow all this, but I don't really think it matters, of Nicanor and uh, Alchemus here. Um, and then we are, the priests are again, line 34 to 36, praying to God to help them so that the temple won't be corrupt, polluted again. And here we have another martyrdom episode. Razis, one of the elders of the people, he denounced Nicanor. He was beloved by his fellow countrymen. He called a father of the Jews, therefore. But he was convicted in the early days of the insurrection. So again, it's a, um, the same insurrection as, uh, as Alchemus did something bad in. Practicing Judaism and risked both his body and life for Judaism. Again, with the utmost zeal. I have zeal again, so another Zealot episode. Nicanor sent 500 men to get it, like we're going to do to Zarqawi. But Razi's finding himself completely surrounded, fell on his own sword, no one was going to die rather than, so here's the suicide that we're going to get in Masada and everywhere else ever after this. But he didn't succeed, he missed. And uh, he went up on the wall and threw himself down among the soldiers who had come to arrest him on 44 and blazing with anger, struggled to his feet, blood spurting, this is worthy of Mel Gibson, blood spurting out in all directions, this terrible wound ran right through the crowd, then taking a stand on a steep precipice, almost losing every drop of blood, he tore out his entrails, <laughs> took them in both hands, flung them at the troops, calling on the master of life and spirit to give them back to him one day. Right there. So, he believes also in resurrection of the dead and he throws his guts at the foreign armies even though he's an old man. Then we have this last episode we already did, chapter 15, where we have this um, help from heaven, line 8. Uh, when Judas is not dead, you see, there's not, he's not going to die in this book. And he has a vision of Onias, line 12, the former high priest who was mur martyred, as you recall, stretching out his hands and praying for the whole nation. And then another equally impressive man of great age and dignity, an heir of majesty, and this turns out to be Jeremiah, who's back from the dead and the prophet of God, he stretched out his hand and he gives Judas the holy sword. A golden sword like King Arthur. Take this holy sword as a gift from God and strike down your enemies. Blah, 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 blah. Then I guess Judas wins the battle and he hung Nicanor's head, line 35, on the citadel. 
clear and evident sign to all of the help of the Lord. So here are the signs and wonders in the Old Testament. They're not exorcisms and that kind of thing. They're the battle gods fights on behalf of his people. And this is the sign, defeating his enemies. And that will be in the war scroll too. Signs and wonders in the New Testament. Resurrections, curings, exorcisms, healings. Those are the mighty signs and wonders. It's a peaceful Hellenistic universe. In these books, Maccabean, Old Testament, signs and wonders in the Dead Sea Scrolls are these battle gods, these battles God fights on behalf of his people against his enemies. The one's cosmopolitan, the other is nationalist. Come neck and neck his head on the citadel, and have it sign to all. another unanimous vote decree to celebrate that day, the 13th day of the 12th month, and the eve of the day of Mordecai. See, it's the, it's the day before Purim, which is the day of Mordecai, if you like, Mordecai and Esther. And that's it. Thank God. We're finished. Finish these two books. God. Okay. Next time, we're going to go through Josephus. So you're going to read your Josephus. And in two periods, we can go through Josephus. And uh, therefore, I do think that we can have a test in three weeks. Now, if you want to have a test in two weeks, we can do it. But I think three weeks is right. Anyone, anyone disagree with that? Fair enough. We'll talk more about the test as we get closer on. Any questions about these two books? No? You want to go home? Okay. See you.